first? Yes. You got them. Share. I appreciate you guys helping out there.
Welcome to the February 10th Special Populations Committee meeting. We're looking forward to a great discussion because we know that there's concern about students uh, who are in recovery from, and especially the ones that are in special populations. First, I'd like to give my colleagues a chance to introduce themselves. So we'll start with our Vice President, Carla. Good morning, everyone. Carla Silvestri. And Rebecca Sondrowski. Good morning. Thank you. And I, would, I wanted to ask the uh, colleagues if there were any questions concerning the December 16th meeting, the minutes from that meeting. None. No concerns? Okay. Then we can move on. Um, today we have one topic and the time. Uh, is to really delve into the robust discussion about this critical topic. We know that learning disruptions impact our special populations disproportionately, and it is vital that we pay <clears throat> close attention to their recovery. We're going to focus today on special education and English language learners. Now, if the staff is prepared to do the presentation, we're ready for it. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Daka, and good morning, everyone. My name is Gwendolyn Mason, and I am the Acting Associate Superintendent for the Office of Special Education. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Daka, Ms. Sandrowski, and Ms. Silvestri, for the opportunity to discuss the impact of the past 18 months on special populations, specifically in my area of special education. Joining me today for this presentation are two of my wonderful staff members. I'll let them introduce themselves, beginning with Phil Lynch. Good morning, board members, and morning to everyone else. I'm Philip Lynch, the Director, Department of Special Education Services in the Office of Special Education. Morning. Good morning to everyone. My name is Brenda. I'm the Assistant to the Associate Superintendent, Dr. Gwen Mason, in the Office of Special Education. So thank you very much once again for this wonderful opportunity. As we begin our presentation today, and we take a look at the academic recovery needs of students with disabilities, one of the things that I wanted to share, which is reflected in our slide presentation today, is a statement that was issued by the Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights in June of 2021. So I'm gonna wait a moment while we adjust to the special education segment. Say it again, maybe they didn't hear you. <laughs> I apologize again. Um, I'm about to begin the conversation. Thank you so very much in reference to special education. So if we can go to the next slide. Thank you so much, Ms. Silvestri. So in June of 2021, the Department of Education issued a report entitled The Disrupted Learning During the Pandemic. And I shared that report with the Office of Special Education in August of 2021 to reiterate the fact that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic adversely impacted students with disabilities at the elementary and the secondary level. We know that due to the impact of the pandemic, many of our students were significantly impacted in the areas linked specific to their IEP for the services and related aids and supports that they needed in order to make progress. We know that because of the pandemic, progress and and the regression that many of our students experiences not only has impacted them for the school year 
and half that they were out of school, but most importantly also for the fact that it exacerbated the learning disparities. And let me just speak to that for a moment. Prior to the pandemic, special education students were already performing significantly below their non-disabled peers. So there was already a significant discrepancy, but now that discrepancy has been exacerbated because we know that the impact of the COVID-19 school closures definitely had an, inverse, an adverse impact on the progress of our students. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll see that our school district at the beginning of the year, when they presented this information to the Board of Education, talked about the six areas of focus that was going to be significant to address the learning loss, not only of students with disabilities, but for all students. And there's an arrow beside certain specific areas that I wanna make sure that we emphasize today as it relates to how the Office of Special Education is addressing this particular impact to students with disabilities. The school implant improvement planning process is an aspect that we have involved ourselves in with this year. Literacy and mathematics as an instructional focus, as well as tutoring and intervention and support and professional learning. If we go to the very next slide, you may recall board members that with the support of the Office of Shared Accountability and the Office of Curriculum and Instruction, you received information about the evidence of learning data. And it showed how this particular pandemic impacted the academic outcomes and performance of our students comparing results prior to the pandemic and then the manner in which our students are functioning today. Special education clearly was adversely impacted in grades two and grades five in the area of literacy. If we take a look at grade two, you'll see that during the 2018-2019 school year, 48.9% of students with disabilities had met the target established by MCPS. But when we returned, we'll see that there's evidence of a 23.5% decrease resulting in 25.4% of our students functioning at a level that demonstrates such a significant impact on our students. Grade five also has evidence of a significant impact in the area of literacy, 37.7% prior to the pandemic and now at 26.7%. It's interesting to note that grade eight does not appear to have been as significantly impacted, but it does not mean that the work doesn't continue to need to be done for that grade range population. And grade 11 showed a slight dip of 0.8%, once again, not statistically significant, but I would still say that even as we look at the overall data for pre-pandemic, it's important to note that our students, even prior to the pandemic, were still functioning significantly below non-disabled students. If we go to the next slide, evidence of how our students were functioning in mathematics also continues to demonstrate a significant decrease not as significant as in the area of literacy in, 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 as compared to mathematics, but the discrepancies and the difference in the way that our students are performing compared to their non-disabled peers continues to be an area of significant concern. So we have grades two, grades five, and grade eight, where we see a decrease, and grade 11, a slight uptick in terms of where our students stand. These particular data are significantly important because it provided the framework for what the Office of Special Education has to do to improve the outcomes for students with disabilities. And one of the key areas is the school improvement planning process. I'm gonna shift the next part of this presentation to Brenda Brown, who will discuss the work that we did this school year to address and to support our schools in the school improvement and planning process. Ms. Brown, next slide, please. Thank you. So when we take a look at this slide, um, during the fall, the Office of Special Education facilitated discussion with our elementary and secondary principals 
around the reading achievement of students with disabilities. And so the discussion began with a comparison about how are K through two students and three through five students, um, when we talked to the elementary principals, how they fared, and then the comparison to how our students with disabilities fared. And we had these particular sets of slides for elementary, middle, and high school principals. If we could go to the next slide, please. We then looked at the data through the lens of performance matters, and we broke it out by grade level to really um, demonstrate to our administrators where our students with disabilities fell within each of the bands by grade level, and that they could do this same analysis at their schools. And as we go to the next slide, we took a look at the strands assessed in the map R, literature, informational text, and vocabulary. And these percentages demonstrate where our students with disabilities had strengths and areas of need. And so though this was systemic data for students in grades three through five, we were able to do the same analysis at the middle and high school level and identify with the principals where, based on the MAPAR data, the students may have needed some additional support and focused instruction. So for this example, we saw that informational text was an area of need systemically for our students with disabilities. As we move to the next slide, we then provided the principals with a series of guiding questions based on that overall MAPRF or MAPR data. Really, here are some questions as a school-based team that they should really be considering to inform the decisions made on their school improvement plans. Really, how does the data reflect in the individual education programs in the present levels of academic and functional performance? Do the data inform the goals, objectives, supplementary aids and services, accommodations, and progress on goals of the IEPs of the students? How are the data and the data analysis resources from the MAP assessments being used to inform planning and instruction? And then how are our grade level or content area teams planning for and implementing the accommodations, supplementary aids and services, assistive technology, so that we know our students with disabilities are provided with equitable access to and the ability to demonstrate progress in their grade level curricular standards. And finally, as we move to the next slide, we affirmed with the principals OSC's commitments, and they are three overarching themes, providing professional learning and job embedded coaching to special educators on the map and other data to inform well-aligned IEPs and specialized instruction. Secondly, operationalizing a range of evidence-based reading and math interventions for students with disabilities, particularly in reading, who demonstrate needs in phonological awareness, decoding, word recognition, fluency, and comprehension. And finally, elevating assistive technology as tools to provide students access to and the ability to progress in the curriculum. So the continue professional learning and support in that particular area. I am now gonna turn it back over to Dr. Mason, who will begin the discussion around compensatory recovery services. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Next slide, please. One of the requirements that every school system in the United States must do is to have discussions with parents about compensatory recovery services, because it's the remedy when a student has not had the opportunity to fully benefit for the implementation of the Individuals with Disabilities Act and due to the negative impact that we know that the pandemic had upon students with disabilities. Our school district, like others, is charged with ensuring that there are discussions with parents by looking at critical data points in the academic areas that are impacted by a student's IEP and to make a determination whether or not those students are in fact required to access compensatory recovery services. 
And while the school system began the compensatory recovery services discussions in spring of 2021, I took the opportunity to work with my team to develop a new enhanced training model that provided them with academic data based upon performance matters so that school teams would have evidence of learning data to ensure that decisions were made based upon real data that provided an excellent uh, set of documentation about how students functioned prior to the pandemic and how students functioned upon their return to school. Brenda Brown, once again, is going to now present to us the process that we use to share with school-based teams. And that included all special education teachers in our county, all related service providers in our county. We had many principals who participated in that discussion, psychologists and other groups to ensure that they understood how we wanted to make certain that these discussions were rich with our parents so that we could properly identify students who in fact needed uh, compensatory recovery services. So Ms. Brown, if we go to the next slide, you can share so, this information. So during the professional learning session, we spent time really talking about data analysis. We identified the critical pieces of data that were in depth and bound in the IEP. And then we wanted to also provide teams with access to performance matters links to analyze how the students performed pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and upon the return to school in fall of last year. So this is just a representation of the data that was collected um, for the discussion that we had at the professional learning session. And staff members who attended were walked through the process. If we go to the next slide, we also wanted to provide school teams with direct access to the Performance Matters links for their specific school populations. So participants received a document like this that was created for elementary as well as secondary. And you will see um, the grade level, there's a spot for English language arts and mathematics. So all that the school teams needed to do was click on that link, sign into Performance Matters, and the data for all of the students with disabilities would populate. So they can then go through that analysis process that was modeled for them in the professional learning. I'm now going to turn it back over to Dr. Mason to share further information and data about compensatory recovery services. Next slide, please. So recognizing that we have a responsibility to conduct these compensatory recovery services discussions, we also have a responsibility to report our status to the state. And so December 15th, we had to report our data to the state in terms of where we were as a district, in terms of our discussions. And I want to take the, a moment to reiterate that this does not just include our students who are in our public elementary and secondary schools. This also includes our students who are in non-public schools. And so in addition to the professional learning that was provided to our public school staff members, we also provided the same quality professional learning to our non-public school principals and directors to make certain that our non-public students are also being considered for compensatory recovery services in academic or social emotional areas as needed. So on December 15th, that was one of the dates that we had to report to the state. We provided them with our overall uh, enrollment data for students with disabilities. And then we provided them with the number of students who have been found eligible as of December the 15th. 3,268 students have been found eligible for services as of December the 15th. And 4,250 students with disabilities were determined not to be eligible for services. We also provide an internal uh, data point that I wanna share with you because we're monitoring whether or not the services that we have determined the students need as a part of 
providing compensation have actually been completed. And what I mean by that is, have they met with their special education teachers or speech pathologists to focus on those areas where the student demonstrated regression? And so as of December 15th, 399 students with disabilities had completed their actual services. Now I want you to know that March the 31st is the deadline that we have given our staff members in Montgomery County to complete all discussions. But I also want you to know that whenever you provide compensatory recovery services, you are given a year to a year and a half from the time of determination of eligibility for compensatory recovery services to receive those actual comp services. So it doesn't mean that every single student by June 30th of 2022 will have completed receiving all of those services. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we go to the next slide. So since the data report in December of 2021 was just shared with you, I'm also with my team continuing to monitor where our services are being provided and how many students are being receiving access to those services. So we have shared uh, this information also with our special education parent community about the service delivery models. So currently we have 197 students who are participating with an actual provider. There are 39 students who have chosen with their families to participate in virtual instruction, either on the e in the evenings or on the weekend. We have 77 students who are working with individual um, MCPS staff members, and they're doing instruction on a face-to-face -face basis. They work with families and they decide on the location where they wanna have those services provided. Some are using public libraries and others are using other community-based facilities. We've also established in our school system some regional locations, and those regional locations include Eastern Middle School, Julius West, Little Bennett, and Rock Terrace. These locations provide services to our students on the weekend, and parents may choose to have their students report for face-to-face -face instruction at one of the locations that's closest uh, to their home. We've also had some services that are being provided through agreements with parents. And so there are parents who have their own individual providers and they may have contacted our resolution and compliance unit um, to have their agreements finalized. And so we have 39 resolution and compliance cases where we work with parents for them to have their services provided. And it might be again in the area of speech pathology or the utilization of a reading intervention. Because we're gonna be offering compensatory recovery services during the summer, some of our parents to date have decided that they're gonna wait until summer 2022. And our record as of uh, this week, uh, February 7th, indicates that 66 students will receive their services during the summer months. But one of the things that we're excited about is that we're continuing to develop a variety of different compensatory recovery services models during the summer to address the academic and social emotional needs of our students. And we're also looking at partnering with the rec therapeutic recreation department because they provide wonderful opportunities for our students in the area of social skills. And we're gonna be paying for our students to access those services. And so they are very excited about partnering with us to provide that particular level of service. We're also going to be creating camps for our students with autism and some camps for our students with social emotional needs or in the special education, social emotional uh, services program in our, in our school system. So we'll be providing more information as we continue to finalize our outstanding ideas and plans for the summer opportunities to address the not only academic needs of our students, but the social emotional needs of our students. Now, before we proceed to the next slide, in which Phil Lynch will be discussing compensatory recovery services, I recognized that as a school system, we have some challenges this year because we have schools that have staffing shortages. And we have been trying to address and support the needs of those schools. 
And one of the things that I asked Mr. Lynch to do was to reach out to those schools so that we can then figure out how to provide supports to schools where we know we have staffing shortages that might compromise the availability of providing direct support to our students. Mr. Lynch has done a fantastic job of doing that and he's gonna share um, his findings with you now. Thank you, Dr. Mason. This has uh, certainly been one of the biggest challenges that some of our schools have faced are those staffing shortages. Um, the Office of Special Education has uh, taken a proactive approach by contacting those principals, as Dr. Mason mentioned, with staffing shortages in the area of special education. And we did that with the goal of determining if they have students who are not receiving reading interventions due to that staffing vacancy. In our communication to schools, we shared that the Office of Special Education is committed to supporting schools with the significant number of vacancies with the implementation of evidence-based reading interventions for students with disabilities. We asked those principals in that survey to provide us with information about students who may fall into that category. The results of that survey indicated that there are seven schools, seven elementary schools who, who have been impacted with the provision of those reading interventions to students with disabilities as a result of those vacancies. Representatives from the Office of Special Education have that student specific information, and we are working to contact families with the goal of connecting uh, that family and that student to a service provider who can implement that reading intervention outside of the school day. Next slide. In addition to supplementing the delivery of reading interventions, at schools with vacancies. Representatives from the Office of Special Education have also been su supporting schools in other ways. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different types of support that we provided to those schools. One is that uh, we have assisted with the process of determining eligibility for those compensatory recovery services, those conversations with parents that Dr. Mason mentioned, and we've supported the completion of IEP meetings. Special education supervisors are also in, in communication with principals to address the needs of students while conducting student observations and attending IEP meetings as needed. Also, Office, Office of Special Education administrators, instructional specialists, and resource teachers have also provided on-site instructional and behavior supports to schools. That looks like helping to cover classes and also helping to support um, the administration of services to students who may require behavioral supports. In several cases, we've established a regular scheduled coverage rotation to support those schools who have significant vacancies. Next slide. The Office of Special Education has also continued to provide professional learning opportunities to special education staff members using both live synchronous instruction as well as online asynchronous online asynchronous modules. We have partnered with the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs to provide professional learning opportunities associated with curriculum implementation. And we remain committed to ensuring that each of our schools has the resources necessary to deliver tier three reading and math interventions. Next slide. Central Office staff members supported quarantine teaching as well by providing synchronous instruction for students with disabilities who were required to shift to virtual instruction based on their quarantine status. During that, those instructional periods, qualified special education staff members from our office were present in the virtual classroom sessions alongside those general education teachers to support the delivery of specialized instruction. We monitored the rosters of those classrooms and we in inserted those specialists into those uh, classroom settings in order to deliver those services virtually. Office of Special Education has also developed and supported virtual classroom instruction for students with significant cognitive disabilities by providing a live synchronous instruction opportunity for those students who are quarantining when their typical classroom teacher is unable to provide that virtual instruction. This time I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Mason. Thank you very much. If we can go to the next slide. So the Office of Special Education recognizes there are many actions that we still have to take to address, again, the impact of our students due to the closure of schools. One of the things that we will continue to do this year is to monitor the completion of the compensatory recovery services process. 
So keep in mind that for every single student, whether they are in a public school or a non-public school, we must have documentation that those discussions were held with families. We have given our schools until March 31st to complete those discussions with all families. And that again includes our non-public schools. We have developed a very sophisticated data tool in which the school staff members, both non-public as well as public schools, have to enter all of the data that documents that the discussions have been held. And that data tool enables us not only to monitor our schools, but also enables us to report accurately to the state. It's going to be imperative that in fall of 2022, there's an analysis and a comparison done between the performance of students with disabilities in fall of 2021 compared to fall of 2022. And let me speak to this um, in these terms. Students with disabilities, we all know, learn many times at a rate that is slower than their non-disabled peers. We need this entire school year to help us to determine the impact of instruction they're receiving daily in their schools in order for us to measure where our students will be in the fall. And that data, again, will drive the actions that the Office of Special Education in collaboration with the Office of Cur Curriculum Instruction will have to continue to and do to improve the outcomes of our students. It's going to be imperative that we look at pre and post data in the areas of reading and math interventions. That is critical and that will again drive the focus of the work that has to be done. We will continue to ensure the implementation of compensatory recovery services. So next year this time, um, if this presentation is uh, given the opportunity to be shared again, there should be updates in terms of where we are with compensatory recovery services and how it has helped to address and to mitigate the learning loss of our students. We also have to continue to be committed to the school improvement planning process. Central Office has a responsibility to support our principals and our school-based staff members with improving the outcomes of our students. And we will continue to utilize uh, examples like was shown by Brenda Brown regarding how to interpret data and then best how to provide the instructional strategies necessary to improve the outcomes of our students. And finally, ongoing professional learning is critical because students with disabilities have very complex needs. Every year we have new staff, we have returning staff. We wanna make sure that we provide them with the best guidance around uh, professional learning and we wanna provide them with coaching. Uh, we are working right now with many of our schools. Uh, Carl Sam Barrick is an example of one, which Brenda Brown is drilling down right now and working with that school-based team around effective instructional strategies in the area of reading and mathematics. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity as we go to the next slide. We'd love to hear your questions and comments and your suggestions regarding our presentation today. Thank you so very much. Ms. Thank Mondrowski. you. Uh, yeah, Ms. Mondrowski, you have your hand up already. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you so much for this presentation. This is really, really very good. I'm, I'm excited to hear that we'll be getting updates on it. This is something that, frankly, I would love even for the full board to be able to get an update on maybe twice a year just to see because um, I, I love hearing what you're doing. Um, one of the things that's hard doing Zoom as opposed to in person is I couldn't like raise my hand and ask a question at the time. So I'm going to kind of, I had my questions sort of listed out a little bit, but um, I don't know if you're going to have to struggle through some of the slides because some of it I didn't fully understand. Um, but I'll, I will start with my um, one question for um, Mr. Lynch. Um, and it's in reference to um, how we're helping to support our special education teachers um, that are, are struggling with staffing shortages as well. And I'm, I was happy to hear uh, you talk about the different supports that you all are, are working to provide them. But one thing that has been um, brought to my attention is that um, as we um, have been working on our budget discussions and things like that, um, you know, we've been working hard to, um, I don't know what the right word is, supplement um, 
general education staff for having to cover things like lunch or um, other things like that. And um, the special education teachers don't necessarily all get that as well. Um, and so I just, um, it's not necessarily a question unless you tell me I'm completely wrong, but it just might be something to kind of look at um, as a part of how we help support them to make sure that they understand that they're valued and that they, we recognize that they too are doing a lot of extra work um, under these unfortunate circumstances. Um, so my, a couple of questions. I, at first I wasn't sure that I really understood what the compensatory recovery supports meant, but I'm guessing from your presentation that it's sort of non-specific. It's, it's, making a determination with each individual student, school, and family to determine what that means. Is that correct? It's very specific to the individual student. And so, for example, if you have a student who has a, 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 an IEP because they mm -hmm. are dyslexic and mm -hmm. they are demonstrating um, evidence that they have regressed in the area of reading, there would be an expectation that utilizing the data that Ms. Brown shared from Performance Matters and from the evidence of learning uh, data that's been shared broadly with our school system, we would be able to drill down and say, there is evidence that your child prior to the pandemic was functioning here, and now the level of regression is here. We need to provide that child then with compensatory services. And so we would then identify a teacher who has expertise in that area, um, to provide that student with services. One thing I did not say, Ms. Androwski, that I'd like to respond to is that there's a period of time that the team also has to determine how long those services need to be provided. Okay. And that will also be based upon um, the nature of the student's disability. And so it could be 16 weeks, it could be 40 weeks, it could be, mm -hmm. so we, it's very, very individualized, but it's very specific. Well, I love that, um, but I'm surprised that only 197 students qualify out of, I mean, wh what's our total number of special education students? So just wanted to clarify that. I'm so glad that you said that because that was a, a slide. That I was like, that's not going to move the needle. <laughs> no. So remember that 197 only reflects the children who are right now deciding to participate in compensatory services right now. We are gonna to have to provide, and if we identify 10,000 children, which I suspect, that's how many children we're gonna to have to provide services for. So that was just a snapshot of right now, the number of children who are actually in situations where they're meeting with a provider, whether it's a speech pathologist or a special ed teacher to receive services. And that we know that we still have until March 31st to complete these discussions. So thank you for asking that question. Sure, because I was gonna say, can can parents or students request to be special services if, um, if they've seen a decrease, a decline in their particular students' uh, overall performance and grades? And again, that, that with the student population that we're talking about is specific to March 20, 2020 through mm -hmm. June, 2021. It is that group of students who were adversely okay. impacted that we're looking mm -hmm. at for this service. Okay, um, one more question and then one more one overall type of thing. Um, students with emotional um, disabilities, um, I'm not sure what if that's the proper terminology, but, um, <clears throat> How are we, I know that for a lot of them, a lot of parents that I've heard from over the pandemic, you know, the online learning was an, an extreme challenge for a lot of them being able to sit and focus, not having the in-person support. Um, how do you make up for that kind of loss? Like, you know, that's not just something that you can, put um, a reading specialist in front of to say, I mean, yes, we need to do that too if like they've lost ground in reading, but how are we working to try and help support those areas of issue as well? So Phil and I will respond to it. I'll say that first of all, we recognize that there was such an emotional impact on many of our students with disabilities and you use the example of an emotional disability. So our providers include psychologists, licensed mm -hmm. clinical social workers. So we're gonna be utilizing specialists um, who can address those mental health 
social emotional challenges. Phil, you want to speak to that because of, you know, the, the goals that we want to work on with our children in that area? Absolutely. And so if, if it is a part of that student's education plan that they receive a service from one of those mental health providers that Dr. Mason mentioned, then it would be considered during that compensatory recovery conversation. And we, again, would be looking at, you know, regression. I will back up a little bit and say that we did our best to, to continue those services, you know, shifting over um, when we could to, to uh, virtual discussions, contacting families. So those mental health providers were really on the front lines during that year that we were uh, virtual. They, they did not, they were not, they didn't stop working and stop connecting with those families and those students. So they were continuing, um, um, uh, you know, to, through the avenues that they had available to them to provide those service. But you're right, when, the, when, when we have those conversations, if, it, if that was a, a service on their IEP, it would be considered. And then they, we would look to those mental health providers that Dr. Mason mentioned to deliver, to be the, you know, the folks that are delivering those compensatory services, whether those are in the form of makeup sessions or you know, whatever that, that is the best fit for that student. Yeah, I appreciate that. I know, um, you know, we, everybody's aware at this point that we've had a, a big uptick in, um, you know, whether it's fighting or um, a, like aggressive type of behaviors. And, you know, we frequently hear that it, there's a lot of it could potentially have been from kids, all kids, having been um, isolated for so long and all of that kind of stuff. And so it just really, I, I constantly am thinking in terms of, you know, like students who are getting in trouble and then it's on their IEP that they had, you know, they don't, they don't do well with um, confrontation with adults and things like that. And I'm just, I'm wanting to make sure that we're doing everything we can to try and support those so that doesn't go straight to disciplinary action, but rather we are recognizing that they perhaps were lacking in some of the supports that they um, may need. Um, which kind of brings me to my final overall thing. This is amazing. And maybe the answer is to uh, Dr. Mason's point that we um, are just in the beginning process. We've only identified 197 specifically so far, or maybe we that's how many are actually receiving, right? So, right, right, now. Right. so, right, so right for right now. So we've completed 399 actual um, compensatory recovery services as of December 15th. And okay. then right now, 197 additional students are getting those services being provided. But okay. I suspect when we really finalize these numbers, we'll be between 10, 11,000 students that are ultimately going to be getting those services. Okay. And that'll be finished by March, did you say? So what will be finished by what will be finished by March 31st are those discussions that identify who's entitled to get compensatory recovery services. But when it comes to the timeline for actually delivering those services, we mm -hmm. have, for example, a year to a year and a half because we have such a window, you know, 18 months of children. So that's how that okay. works. Okay. So that helps me a little bit because my question really is, and you know, I, I try very hard to think of ways to say, to ask this without it coming across in an, in a, as a negative, but I'm just going to put it out there. You know, it feels like we're doing as, as much as I can, listening to this presentation, I would say it seems like we're doing as much as I can think of to possibly do. And so I guess my question is, you know, I, you see, there's still students who are struggling and parents who are still upset what more can we do? Like, how, how can we really, if we're looking at every child and individually, you know, identifying student needs and additional supports and all of that, is it working? And if not, why not? And what can we be doing? So thank you so much. Um, one of the things that we believe in the Office of Special Education is being accessible to our parents. Any parent who has a concern they can reach out to me. They can reach out to Mr. Lynch. We will try to work with them case by case. I've done it historically over the years. I've always opened up my door to every single parent. And that's our philosophy. Special education is complex mm -hmm. without question. <laughs> and we realize that. And we want to support our parents through this difficult and, and, and complex uh, 
framework. So I want to make sure, and Phil and I have even said to the special education advisory committee leadership members and to them, if you know of any parent who has a concern, mm -hmm. we want them to be also a source for us to help us to get to those parents. So we was, just want you to know, as, and even as board members, I know many of them respect you all so very much. Please direct those parents to us so that we can provide them with support. We'll be happy to do that. And so we're gonna just do our very, very best. I will tell you this, that the, we're using evidence-based practices, we're using professional learning, we're using everything that the research says we're supposed to do. But we also know that there's a lot of work that still has to be done. So please direct those families to us so we can support them. I appreciate that very, very much. And I will do that. I know that it's, you know, one of those, every parent wants as much as they can to help their each child. And I recognize that as a, a system, we can't necessarily just tell everyone, oh, that's what you want. Okay. Um, because it's that's just right. not reasonable. That's both right. financially and in, in manpower and whatever resources. But, um, but I do know that, you know, from my own personal experience, trying to figure out what it actually takes to mm -hmm. make your child be successful can sometimes be quite a process yes. and be very frustrating. And if so, I just appreciate the work that you all are doing to be direct with parents and, and um, personal with parents because it, it makes a difference. It matters. So thank you all for your work. Thank you so much, Ms. Sondrowski. Thank you, Dr. Mason and Dr. Lynch and Dr. Brown. Now I'm gonna go to Ms. Sylvester to see if she has some questions. Thank you. Um, a couple following up on Ms. Mondrowski's, just making sure I understand the numbers. Um, 20,585 special ed students enrolled. This was your slide. 32, 3268 are already uh, compensato compensatory recovery services eligible. So you've already had those conversations with 3,268 families about their students. Um, 399 are completed and 197 are currently in progress. So the, the 3,268 will grow as you continue to have these conversations until March 1st, which is not that far away. <laughs> So, so to clarify, uh, they have until March 31st, to, 31st complete those, okay. uh -huh, to complete those discussions. And then the one data point, Ms. Silvestri, is that 4,250 determinations have been held, but they were not found eligible for services. So we have to um, have both data points. What, why would that be? What, what, why wouldn't they be eligible for services? Because there's, because the data may support they indicate that they did not regress so significantly okay. that it would require it. And that's why we wanted to make sure that we were giving our schools excellent data so they could really drive a decision, not just based upon a hunch or I think, but it's based upon data. And that's how that's determined. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then around the, the staffing shortages, um, your slide says that seven elementary schools were identified as having um, a problem and therefore they were not going to be able to help the students if the staff was not there. Um, and the solution was that the students could get tier three interventions or tier three instruction outside of the school day. Can you help me understand that? Um, sure. So if a special education teacher is not there, then who's going to provide the instruction outside of the school day? So we have special education staff members who work beyond the school day. These are some of the same sets of individuals who are providing compensatory recovery services beyond the school day. And so we are tapping into those staff members who are available and who want to work with students beyond the school day. And so we want to make sure that we are being proactive I don't want a parent to think that they have to file a state complaint. We are being progressive in saying, we have identified the fact that your school has a vacancy. Your child has not been able to receive reading interventions during the school day. We are going to be responsible for providing a teacher 
to work with your child at a time that you find mutually agreeable to offer those particular services. So we're tapping into this wonderful pool of teachers and service providers who are the same sets of individuals who support compensatory recovery services. Because one thing I didn't say, compensatory services have to be provided beyond the school day. The law doesn't allow us to provide it during the school day. And that's the caveat. Does that help a little bit, Ms. Silvestri, with your question? And this is, this is part of your regular special education budget, or is this from federal funding? Because of the we're, pandemic? Definitely, we're definitely utilizing our ESSER funds to support us with our compensatory recovery services. Yes, that's our funding source. Okay. And then now, um, from the perspective of a teacher, so if I'm a second grade teacher and I have, um, well, let's just say one for simplicity, but we know that teachers have more than one special education student in their, uh, in their classrooms. Um, so you're telling me that the teacher has access to the map data and is able to see, um, I guess, where is the decision making at what point is it the teacher that decides this student is going to need this set of interventions? Uh, is it the school improvement team to the to the student level? So Ms. Um, Brown is going to respond to that question. It's a good, great question, Ms. Silvestri. Ms. So Ms. Silvestri, um, and I'm speaking from actually having done them in my past position at a school last year. And so as a special educator, I know that Carla Silvestri is one of the students that I case manage and Carla Silvestri has goals in expressive language and speech um, and reading and writing because she's a student with dyslexia. I am going to, with the team that includes, you know, collaboration with the classroom teacher, with the speech language pathologist, we are going to look at report card data. We are going to look at um, IEP goal progress. We are going to also, we have a set of questions that we have the um, teachers when they're meeting with the parents and guardians, we ask parents, do you think your child is making progress? How, what did you see? And so it's, a very, it's actually a discussion. It typically happens via Zoom and it can include um, the entire school-based folks who are working with that student, or it can be a pre-collaboration with the school-based team and the case manager is having the discussion with the parent and guardian. So after we go through all of the IEP data and the data from the Performance Matters link, we're getting parent perspective, we're looking at the data and we're looking in the areas in which the student had goals during that period. So I'm gonna go back to the example where you're my little third grade student, Ms. Silvestri. Um, and we definitely are able to see, you know what, prior to the pandemic, you know, Carla scores on do 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 and her OG or her what, you know, mm, it, she was really making that nice progress. We saw her doing this and maybe a little bit of this during the pandemic, but when she got back to school, things kind of picked up. So, you know, that would be an indicator that you need compensatory recovery services in your phonemic awareness or phonics goal. And then we would have a discussion and we'd really take time to discuss and analyze your rate of progress with that historical data to say, you know what? I think in the area of her phonemic awareness and fondness goals, if there wasn't the pandemic based on this data, we can project you know, with some certainty where we thought you would be. And then we would decide on the number of hours of service. And for a particular student with whom I worked last year, um, we identified that that student needed, for an example, 10 additional hours of compensatory recovery services for the goals that addressed phonemic awareness and phonics. And the parent, you know, the parent was like, oh, 
you know, we could go back and forth and then we allow the parent to kind of decide, would you like it centrally managed by finding a provider through our CRS instructional specialist or school managed? And for a particular couple of students, you know, teachers were providing those services that teachers who knew that student, teachers, special educators, or the whoever in the school who knew that student are providing those services. And then, you know, there's documentation that, you know, what happened on session X and Y and, and that kind of thing. Does that clarify it a little bit more for you, Ms. Silvestri? It, it does the compensatory, but I guess maybe ask a, a different question. Um, there's all kinds of interventions happening across the school system in general ed because of the pandemic and having to uh, do learning recovery. How did those interventions overlap with what a special education student would get or not overlap or, um, you see what I mean? It's like- I, I certainly do. So for example, in special education, we know that many of our students are there because the intensity of their needs is very, very great. And so when we do go to a like a level three type of intervention or a tier three level intervention, it might be Orton Gillingham that that student was participating in. And so as a part of the services that they receive, we would continue uh, to make sure that they are continuing to receive access to that evidence-based intervention based upon what they have been deemed appropriate to receive. So we've always consistently tried to match the intervention with the individual you know, student. And so yes, there are um, select interventions that special education does use for its students. And we wanna make sure that when we do provide that compensatory recovery services, that we're keenly aware of what they were in um, that we need to then address as a part of the, the compensatory recovery services uh, component. So we make very de decisive decisions about the interventions for our students. Ms. Silvestri, they can, the students will continue to receive the specialized instruction during the school day. And then afterwards, they would receive the compensatory services that were identified. Was that more clarifying for you? Yeah, but with the example of um, Orton Gillikin, yes. I can't say a second word. Um, that's an intervention that is also being used with general education students, correct? It certainly can be. And so, it just, again, interventions are utilized based upon the needs of the student, general ed or special education. But since our focus um, with our special population students, we know that um, our school district chose Orton Gillingham as one of those specific interventions. So a student can get that during the day, but it's evident that if they're still, if the CRS discussion yielded outcomes that said, there's still a major deficiency in the area of reading, we wanna continue to provide that additional uh, service beyond the school day. So that, that's, how it's, that's how it's addressed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that were all my questions. Can I can I ask a follow up question to that, Dr. Zaka? Uh, I I wanted to. Well, there are several things I wanted to say. I was concerned about slide fifteen for both Ms. Wondrowski and Ms. Silvestre. I've asked questions about the numbers, and uh, I just wanted to say that every year in special ed, you have to look at the IEP and figure out what needs to be done. So this is not different except that it's massive. It's much more than they usually have to do. And I really appreciate what, what Ms. Brown or Dr. Brown? Ms. Brown? Ms. Brown, Ms. Brown, for now, I'm looking into the doctorate. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Ms. Brown explained exactly how it works from her perspective, because she has done it. And I, I really did appreciate that, especially the part about after school, because a lot of people might not know that. And if they do it at the school and it's after school, we provide transportation. Some of our elementary students have been able to stay after school and then, um, not elementary, I'm sorry, middle school students because they have those activity buses and things okay. of that nature. I will say, uh, Dr. Daka, that um, for compensatory services, 
transportation is not a legal requirement. So I don't want anyone to think that we're violating a parent's rights. Um, it's not legally required, but we do have to make sure that we do provide the service, but transportation is not a legal requirement. Yeah, I thought that, that we should talk about service, especially when we're talking about after school and, okay. and other places where a teacher might need is similar to our program for students that are ill or can't come to school. And we have a, a core of persons who are able to work with them. So this is uh, very similar. Uh, Orton Dillingham, would you describe that for the parents and the others in the audience? What is it exactly? Ms. Brown, would you like to describe Orton Gillingham? So Orton Gillingham is a methodology for explicit, multi-sensory, sequenced instruction that has been around since 1912-ish, um, 1915-ish. And so any evidence-based reading intervention worth its salt uses Orton Gillingham methodologies. Orton Gillingham addresses phonological awareness, which is the manipulation of the 44 speech sounds in the English language, um, being able to hear them, being able to manipulate them, being able to isolate them. And then moving on to phonics, which is that sound symbol correspondence. And then it's building on patterns such as the consonant vowel consonant, the, you know, diagraphs and all of the blends, all of those things in a very systematic, age appropriate way that is monitored. And that it also incorporates sight word instruction. It also incorporates writing. There are opportunities for those decodable texts. So we're asking, let's say, for example, I'm going to use Ms. Mondrowski as my student now. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Mondrowski and I are working in Orton Gillingham level one. There's a pretest that determines where a student will start. And she's starting in the level where we are working on things like vowel teams, E, 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 A all of those kinds of things. There's a specific lesson sequence. And then part of that is that decodable text. We want to provide students with a decodable text to be able to practice what they have learned, where the words are controlled. We are having students read. We're doing things that, you know, modeling for fluency and for comprehension, okay? And so teachers receive um, 30 hours of initial professional learning from the Institute for Multisensory Education, that is our contractor that the Board of Education approved, to provide this instruction. And there are specific points that we are doing ongoing systemic progress monitoring, but within the intervention itself, there are progress monitoring checks um, where the students are dictating sentences, um, they're writing words, they're answering those comprehension questions from the decodable texts and so forth. Wow, that's really very complete description of it. And it is, sounds like something that every student has to have a piece of if we're teaching reading uh, and writing the correct way. But thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, I said I already had questions, the same questions that Ms. Silvestri, Ms. Mondrowski had about the numbers of students that will be examined to find out what it is that they need to do for compensatory education. 197 and then 399 have been completed, so we know what they need. It's amazing that you're going to do 3,268 by June. So I know that you're working really hard, but Thank you so much for letting us see uh, these, uh, these figures. Um, You're welcome. Would you, would you mind talking about the assistive technology? It was mentioned earlier. What exactly is that? Brenda or Phil, I know that uh, Brenda was referencing your slide. Yes. Uh, for an example, we have two teams um, in the Office of Special Education who work with assistive technology. The Hyatt team, the High Incidence Accessible Technology team, as well as the Interact team. They serve two different student populations. 
Typically, our Hyatt team supports our students who are pursuing grade level outcomes and advancing towards a high school diploma. Our Interact team typically supports students um, who are pursuing alternate learning outcomes who have significant cognitive disabilities because their communication needs are complex and different than their less disabled peers. Okay, so I'm gonna really focus more on the Hyatt team um, service provision. They have uh, specialists that go out and will support schools in identifying the appropriate assistive technology tools such as text-to-speech, speech-to-text. So text-to-speech, there is a um, computer program that is available on the Chromebooks of every student with a disability and an English, uh, a student who is an EML, Emergent Multilingual Learner, that will provide speech-to-text. So there is text, they learn how to use this um, software and it will read the text to the students. Oh, okay. okay, so that they can access grade level curriculum by mitigating their issues with decoding or phonological awareness. Then um, speech to text are students who have um, concerns or issues in the writing process, getting what's in their head out on paper or students who may have fine motor issues so that they are able to use a software that dictates what they say. They can then hear it back and then make the corrections that they need to make. So they're still involved in the writing process because um, that's very important. And then there are other tools, um, but those are just two examples of tools that um, we definitely train um, school teams on and they we um, then the school-based team will work with the teachers and the students to ensure that there is ongoing access. I have coached students on how to use these tools. I have coached parents um, on how to use those those tools. Um, last year there was with and I always get this office right. Is it OFSI, the Office of Student Family Support and Engagement under uh, Mr. Everett Davis? They had parent academy sessions with the staff members from our office to be able to present these tools to our parent guardian community to really increase knowledge, access, and awareness. And how even, you know, giving that parent guardian to say, hey, did you use your blah, blah, blah for your homework today? So, because it's on the, the Chromebooks that the students have and they can be transported, you know, back and forth um, from school to home and, and vice versa. Well, thank you again. Um, Ms. Silvestri, did you have anything else that you wanted to ask? Thank you, Dr. Daka. Yeah, um, I understand that the district is, uh, moving away from balanced literacy to structured literacy. And um, just in layman's terms, because I'm not an educator, what does that mean for special education students? I am gonna ask Ms. Brown to answer that question because she is an expert in the area of reading. So I'll let her respond to that. So I have to say that is an exciting um, opportunity. Um, I have um, been working with Malika Brown, the elementary ELA supervisor um, in discussions with respect to that. So structured literacy focuses on the five components of reading, phonological awareness, phonics and word recognition, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. And so structured reading provides, again, a systematic, multi-sensory, tightly sequenced instructional strategies that support students being able to get to know how to read in those areas. And that structured literacy really focuses on, they're the two pillars that, you know, really focusing on that, um, 
basic that foundational skills, phonics, phonological awareness, word recognition. Because really when we think about this, I could go on forever and tell me if I'm getting too technical, but the this, this simple view of reading, really that word recognition multiplied by the language equals you're, you're, you're rocking and rolling in reading. Sometimes our students lack the um, pieces in the foundational skills, which will then negatively impact their reading. It's like a multiplication sentence, okay? So if you're zero at the phonological awareness piece multiplied by one, you've got the comprehension speech piece, your overall reading is gonna be at what? Zero, because zero times any number is zero. But if you're one in the first area multiplied by one in the second area, your overall reading is going to be a one. Does that make sense to you, Ms. Uh, Sylvester? So it's a good thing for- It's for a good thing for all students because it will, in my humble opinion, it will decrease the rate of referrals for students with to, to special education because we're providing everyone, it's a tier one instructional focus so that all teachers um, will, you know, will know how to provide that excellent first instruction in those areas, in addition to the language comprehension pieces of, you know, text structure and all of the go those good things that in vocabulary, all of those good things that make a good reader. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Bondar, I should get my doctorate in reading. What do you think? What? <laughs> Definitely you should. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to remember um, what I was going to ask about, but it was in reference to what uh, Ms. Silvestre was asking about um, before. It... Oh, well, let me start with this. All of this, this, um, this stuff that we're doing, the compensatory recovery services, is that just for now? I, I'm assuming it's being funded by um, COVID um, funds, like federal funds or whatever. So if we see tremendous gains through this, um, are we, are, I'd love for us to be able to keep track of the fiscal um, aspect of it so that if it's something that we need to talk about in our um, operating budget discussions, um, we can look at trying to find ways to continue some of these practices going forward be, beyond the funding of the federal um, support. Um, so that's not really a question, just kind of the question was, is this only now or is this something we'll likely be doing for a long time or is it gonna be over in two years or maybe we don't know, but um, I just wanna make sure that if it's working that we have what we need to continue it. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have our ESSER funds. Uh, we feel that to, to fulfill the requirements that the US Department of Education has set, we, we do feel that we have sufficient funds from that budgetary perspective to complete the discussions for all 20,000 some odd students. I will say to you that um, there has never been a time before in the history of special education that a school system has been asked to convene these kind of discussions for every single student. But that's just because of the horrible impact that the closure of schools had on our students. But compensatory recovery services or, or compensatory services has always been a legal remedy whenever a school system fails to provide the provision of services for a student. So regardless of whether or not there's a closure due to pandemic, for other reasons, if a, if a child has been denied uh, access to services, we always have a legal obligation to have that discussion. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Yes. Um, okay, then this um, other last question is probably a little more complicated than it should, needs to be, but it's about um, IEP goals progress. Um, I, as a parent of a special education student, I pretty much always, like every one of the goals always read in progress, in progress, in progress. Um, I guess most of them didn't get to be completed because they were the type of goals that had ongoing, um, you know, like, you know, you'll, it's not like a 
cured or I um, mm. <laughs> completed necessarily ever. But um, how would, how do we indicate on IEPs if a child is not has been regressing in their progress or what I'm I guess what I'm I'm not sure how to ask the question but is everything just kind of always in progress if it's not mastered or is it are there because I hear from some parents who have said oh my kids I you know the report card's all wrong because my child's really struggling but their goal reads in progress and their their grades have gone down so is it really in progress or is how do we identify that and how do we like notify about that I think Phil Lynch could answer that question for us (laughs) yeah that's a great that's a great question so you know every goal needs to be the progress on every goal needs to be supported by specific data points and in fact when special education teachers and teams work to write those goals in collaboration with parents they have to indicate you know what are the data points that are going to be used to measure progress along the way And so at those quarterly uh, progress moments, that data should be uh, shared and should be a part of the the information sharing that goes to parents at the same time the report card comes out so that they can see what specific data points were used to determine whether the student was making progress. It is true that we do have some goals that are what we call spiraling so that they they may continue uh, from year to year based on um, the changes that are happening with the curriculum. So while the while the, some of the language in the goal may remain the same, you know the the criteria for success may up. So you may have a student for whom you know at one point that it's appropriate for them to have a goal that says that they're going to meet uh, five out of ten trials to to um, achieve that goal. But then as they uh, you know as they they make progress, the following year when the annual review team when the IEP team meets, they may they may say you know this goal is still appropriate, but we're going to up the criteria to eight out of 10, because we see that, you know, students make, so in that type of situation, it may, uh, ha- may continue to indicate that the student um, is, is making uh, uh, ongoing progress, but what is important really for the parent to be able to see, and, and uh, you know, we, what we advocate when we will have this opportunity to share this information with parents is that they need to look for those specific data points that say what type of progress the student has made. Sometimes that's work samples, um, you know, if it's a writing goal, for example, it might be work samples to, to where we can see that they're going from, you know, that sentence writing goal to the paragraph writing goal, you know, to the essay writing, you know, so, so it may increase in that respect. Um, but it's really about looking at the, you know, the, the data points for each of those, uh, each of those goals. Uh, and that's what we would, you know, we would want parents to be asking questions about, and they should be able to see that progress through the, through that data. Well, so I, I don't want to mention. I'm, I'm going to have to say that we've got to move on. Because okay, I'm just going to finish with this thought. Um, so I, I'm not going to mention the name, but you know, I, I think all of you have connected with this parent as well. But you know, they their child was reading at a you know fifth grade level before the pandemic. They they were after eight months, whatever, reading at a third grade level type of thing, but their IEP still read in progress. And that parent was very frustrated by the, is it just always in progress if they're making declines? And I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how we are letting parents know that we recognize, but I, I understand this individualized instruction aspect should address that, but just overall with IEPs, sometimes if we can figure out how to let parents know that in progress doesn't mean that we don't recognize that the challenges may have increased, I guess is sort of my thing. And then just finally, as um, uh, Mr. Lynch, as a follow-up, I did hear from a special education teacher who wrote the class coverage increases in pay for teachers covering for teachers doesn't apply to special education teachers having to cover for absent paraeducators during their non-teaching periods. Um, they lose just as much time, if not more, and don't get any acknowledgement. So if we could just look into that and you could do a follow-up on how we're gonna address it, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank you all for the presentation for the specificity, because these are things we really need to know about. And um, I, I'm just gonna have to take time here. I had 125 students out of 650 that were reading, were receiving special ed services. So I always said to my teachers, 
the services that special ed teachers do in analyzing and uh, providing instruction for students is something that general ed teachers really should pay attention to because I think you uh, do a tremendous job of meeting the needs of students and really thinking about uh, the percentages in your mind of what the students need to do. So thank you so much for your presentation. Thank and you so much. We'll have to move on to the language emergent. And that's with um, Ms. Jennifer Norton. Yes. Thank you so thank much. You. Okay, we're going to turn this over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Jennifer Norton, Director for the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. I am joined uh, with co-presenters Tamara, Tom, sorry, <laughs> Tamara Hewlett and Sandra Blotner, who are the supervisors for elementary and secondary ELD programming, respectively. I am so pleased to be here today to provide an update on our programming and supports for our emergent multilingual students who we know have been impacted by the pandemic over the past two years. Next slide, please. Today, we will focus on three key areas. First, I will share an overview of the newly formed department and key data that focuses in on recently enrolled students. Then Tamara Hewlett will present on an elementary ELD and SLIFE programming and interventions. And Sandra Blotner will discuss secondary ELD and METS programming. Next slide. As a new department, we bring together many different aspects of programming for emergent multilingual learners, also known as English learners. We manage the Title III grant, the enrollment count provided to the Maryland State Department of Education, staffing allocations for teachers and paraeducators, and we manage access test administration in collaboration with the Office of Student Accountability. Uh, we continually refine our data collection and our you know, really trying to use our data to drive planning and progress monitoring. Uh, we also manage the Title VI American Indian Education Program, which provides an evening tutoring program for students who are American Indian. Um, we also organize the annual English Language Development Student, Teacher, Principal, and Community Member of the Year um, awards and the nomination um, window will open in early March. Um, as you might know, our department unfortunately experienced a heartbreaking loss a few weeks ago. Our two-way immersion coordinator, Andy Gomez, an incredible person, an inspiring bilingual educator, passed away. The team is still processing this loss, but one step we are taking to honor his memory um, and his impact on students is to introduce a two-way immersion teacher of the year award this year. In a few slides, you will hear more about the department's programming and supports in elementary and secondary schools. You will learn about the work we are doing on co-teaching and content area collaboration which help afford emergent multilingual students both rigor and support within content instruction. You will hear about two-way immersion programs and our specialized supports for students with limited and interrupted formal education. And you will hear an overview of the interventions and professional learning our teams provide. Next slide. Um, I do want to frame by sharing that the work we do is guided by the four big ideas stated in the state English language development standards framework. First, equity of opportunity and access. Emergent multilingual students have the right to equitable access to content and language instruction, and we believe our students can do amazing things when appropriately um, and simultaneously supported and challenged. Second, Students benefit from integrated content and language instruction, which you'll be hearing more about in the coming slides. Third, emergent multilingual students are everyone's students and collaboration is key for fully supporting student success. 
Fourth, students learn best when they interact with and use language for a purpose, such as explaining a math strategy to a friend. Um, our department's vision is that all MCPS teachers and school leaders provide integrated content and language instruction that is responsive to emergent multilingual learners' languages, cultures, and social emotional well being. We are also guided by the MCPS Board of Education policy on non discrimination, equity, and cultural proficiency, uh, which states MCPS will work toward empowering emergent multilinguals, English learners, to master social and academic English using their first languages and cultures as assets to thrive in school, college, careers, and as global citizens. MCPS will provide access to rigorous coursework and equal access to comparable academic programs, both among schools and among students within the same school without regard to actual or perceived characteristics. We know that the pandemic has adversely affected our emergent multilingual learner students and that our grounding in these principles and vision are more important than ever to support students' growth and well being. Next slide. As we work towards continually refining and improving our programs, we are undertaking a program evaluation requested by the board. The Center for Applied Linguistics will lead the work with guidance from a commission of stakeholders. The evaluation will include document review, classroom observations, focus groups, quantitative data review, an interim report, and a final report. We look forward to this deep dive into our programming to gain recommendations on high leverage changes to processes and structures in order to optimize students' educational experiences and outcomes. Next slide. Okay, so as you know, the number of students who are emergent multilingual learners has increased this year. Um, with a total of 29,714 students overall. About half are in the beginning stages of learning English. Next slide. Um, we know that data on um, our emergent multilingual learners EOL performance has already been presented to the board, so we are not going to represent it here. However, we are going to provide a spotlight on newcomers who have enrolled through the International Admissions Office since this summer. As you know, MCPS has been welcoming new students throughout the school year. This slide zeroes in on the students who have been enrolled through IAE and have been identified as eligible for English language development services. By the end of the first marking period, nearly 1,000 students were newly identified as emergent multilingual learners. Of these, 128 were identified as having limited or interrupted formal education, also referred to as SLIFE. And those students are receiving additional supports to accelerate their learning. The number of newly enrolled emergent multilingual learners nearly doubled by the end from the end of marking period one to the end of marking period two, with the biggest jumps at the high school level. And we now have 302 students who are newly enrolled who have been identified as SLIFE. And of these students, we have only a slight number of newcomers who have unenrolled. I think it's 17 in all of this group of newly enrolled students. Next slide. We are monitoring attendance for newcomers as shown in this slide. Um, a large number of newcomers have been absent for 10% or more of school days. The column marked NA means the students are so newly enrolled that they do not have enough attendance data to flag. Um, and you know, given the extreme rise in COVID cases in December and January, these attendance rates are not um, entirely unexpected. However, now that the COVID case rate has so greatly declined, we hope to see these attendance rates improve drastically and um, we'll continue to monitor this. Next slide. 
Here you see the percentage of newcomer students with marking period one grade, grades of B or higher. Um, I want to emphasize though that 80% of newcomers have um, an English language proficiency level of one and are in the beginning stages of learning English. And this is just one data point for understanding students' progress at their new schools in a new country. We are currently working on pulling data from various interventions so we can understand students' um, baselines and growth on other me uh, measures. We hope to present that in a future board meeting, I believe the one scheduled for end of March, um, where we will share um, what we're learning from those interventions. I am now going to turn it over to Tamara Hewlett to talk about um, elementary programming. Next slide. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning and thank you for providing me with an opportunity to share a little about our elementary English language development program in service of our emergent multilingual learners. My name is Tamara Hewlett and I am the supervisor of the elementary uh, ELD program. I'm going to share a little about the program and about the different ways we are approaching mitigating learning loss for our youngest learners who are adding English to their linguistic repertoire. As Dr. Norton shared, we have the pleasure of working in service of over 18,700 students at the elementary level. Our English language proficiency levels indicate that about half of our students are at the proficiency levels of one and two which are the beginning stages of their English language acquisition. And about 9,000 of our students are about at the levels of three and four, uh, which that means they're on their way to meeting with proficiency in order to exit English language development services. Next slide, please. Over the past few years, our team has worked diligently to shift schools away from a program model of pulling students out of the classroom to receive language instruction that is not connected to the grade level standards and academic language demands to a plug-in co-teaching model. Research shows that when done correctly, co-teaching is a model that benefits all students from, um, all students benefit from that model, including our emergent multilingual learners. As a result, this is the model that we recommend to schools. To support in this effort, we have provided professional learning around co-teaching to all of our first and second year cohort teachers and um, professional learning last summer around co-teaching, which included discussions and expl explorations about the barriers that prevent successful co-teaching. This training is available to all teachers in our professional learning library in our my MCPS classroom. Co-teaching allows our emergent multilingual learners to stay in their classrooms with their peers who serve as language models. Depending on the model of co-teaching, students are working in small groups with either their teacher or their ELD teacher, learning the grade level academic language that supports their grade level content um, in a targeted manner. Both the ELD and the classroom teacher can also provide scaffolded instruction to match the language and academic needs of our EMLs, which is thoughtfully planned for. It's important to note that in 2017, our team started to work on shifting mindset and practices of our ELD teachers and schools in regards to language development. In the past, instruction focused on grammar instruction and survival English. And research has shown that focusing ELD instruction on grade level academic language with the appropriate supports results in successful language development of our students. From 2017 to 2020, the shifts in this approach took uh, our exit rates at the elementary level from an 11% exit rate, rate which was about 1,800 1, students in one year, uh, K to five, to about 16.1% in 2020, which was about exiting 3,000 students in one year. Co-teaching as a model provides the opportunity to focus on the language development 
in a way that allows students to make meaning and have learning contextualized. Another aspect of our ELD program involves our two-way immersion schools. Currently, we have five two-way immersion schools where students are learning 50% of the day in English and 50% of the day in Spanish. Many of our students are either adding English or Spanish to their linguistic repertoire, thus meeting the program goal of bilingualism and biliteracy. For some students, they're adding a third or fourth language to their linguistic repertoire. Our TWI program have had to make adjustments over the past two years to support the ever evolving environment, but they continue to hold true to the three pillars of dual language, which are bilingualism and biliteracy, high academic achievement, and sociocultural competence. The last aspect of our ELD program that we'd like to discuss are our students with limited or interrupted formal education or SLIFE. Information on, uh, on SLIFE has been presented to the board before, but we just wanted to give you an update as to how many students we have formally identified and are supporting. There are currently 55 SLIFE at elementary level, at the elementary level across 31 schools. Our three SLIFE coaches provides service to the students and staff to these uh, in, in a coaching model, supporting teachers in the classroom and through directly providing support to students in an effort to accelerate learning. It is important to note that the 55 student count includes students who are new this year and some who were previously identified as SLIFE. Next slide, please. As we think about the different ways we are providing support for students who need tier two and tier three interventions, we are focused on small group interventions, uh, which is in addition to first instruction. We offer language-based interventions for different groups of students. So as you can see on the chart, for SLIFE, we are offering Imagine, Imagine Language and Lit uh, the intervention. We currently have 34 SLIFE enrolled in this program. Imagine Learning is an adaptive, personalized learning pathway that accelerates the four domains of language proficiency and literacy for students in grades pre-K to six through the use of first language support and English phonemes. We also have the intervention ILIT ELL, which focuses on the literacy growth of students in grades four and five. This intervention is geared towards the students who have stagnated in their language development based on criteria, which has not, um, which also shows they, they are not meeting certain academic benchmarks. Uh, and this intervention provides a more focused language and literacy program. We currently have 58 students enrolled from eight of our schools in ILIT ELL. Lexia ELD is one of our newest interventions that we launched last school year. Lexia English Language Development is an adaptive blended learning program that supports students' English language development through academic conversations. The program integrates three key areas of speaking, listening, and grammar, promoting academic conversations in the subjects of math, science, social studies, and general knowledge, and biographies. Students receive instant feedback on their speaking through the speech recognition software from student-friendly, culturally responsive characters who guide them through their language development. We currently have 286 students at the beginning proficiency level enrolled in Lexia ELD. Students in 49 schools uh, access this program. Lastly, we have uh, three interventions uh, that we have at our two-way immersion schools. We have iStation, Soluciones, and Rigor. And it serves as a Spanish language development support for students who are not yet meeting with their Spanish proficiency. iStation offers both English and Spanish literacy supports 
and soluciones and rigor provides primary and intermediate supports respectively. Next slide, please. Professional development is provided to teachers for all of the interventions discussed on the previous page. We also provide pro professional development in a cohort approach for our first and second year ELD teachers. It is very important that our teachers new to our program have the professional learning, which includes an understanding of the WIDA standards framework, providing appropriate scaffolds, co-teaching, and co-planning. We also provide professional learning for all of our ELD teachers three times a year. In these sessions, we provide the most up-to-date research and techniques on teaching the language of math, English language arts, science, and social studies. Our TWI schools also engage in professional learning, and this year we have a voluntary PLC that focuses on writing from a bilingual approach. In response to the ever-changing times, we also off offer office hours to our ELD teachers, and we share updates or recent information that they should know. These are some of the professional learning opportunities that we are engaged with, and we continue to partner with content areas in an effort to demonstrate how language and content work in tandem. Next slide, please. One example of this collaboration is a new series of professional learning we provide for our teachers and staff that supports life. This PLC started this year, and we have partnered with the ELA and math team to provide professional learning on how to bridge content gaps for SLIFE while providing access to grade level content. Members of the PLC spend half of the day learning how to best instruct the content areas of math and English language arts. And the afternoon session focuses on a partnership that we have with Apple and explores with teachers how to leverage the technology of an iPad to help further provide access and opportunities to our SLIFE students. Our first joint session with Apple is in two weeks and we're so excited to get started on this innovative partnership. We continue to innovate with a partnership that our team started with Support Ed and Dr. Diane Steer-Fenner as we approach learning using a cluster model approach. In this partnership, our team, in collaboration with various school support and improvement teams, work with Support Ed to provide a cyclical learning experience that includes professional learning at the macro level and then school visits to see how schools put the learning into practice while offering some coaching and next steps. The cycle finishes with a reflective opportunity where all participants come together and share their work and ideas around continuous improvement for the benefit of the group. This school year, the Support Ed Partnership includes a feeder school cohort where an elementary school that feeds into a middle school work and learn together as a measure of consistent research-based approaches being implemented on behalf of our EMLs. Lastly, we continue to partner with English Learner Portal to offer learning not only for our ELD teachers, but also for content teachers and professional non-classroom-based positions like media specialists, reading specialists, staff development teachers, et cetera. The learning is focused and targeted and also provides participants an opportunity to earn graduate credit for successful completion of the course. I will now pass the, this part of the presentation on to Sandra Blotner, the secondary ELD supervisor. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Hewlett, um, for just passing it on. Hi there, Dr. Daka, um, Ms. Ms. Trimandrowski, and um, Ms. Silvestri. It's an absolute pleasure to share some updates with you about what's going on with our secondary ELD program. Um, as you heard in the data, we talked about 10,788 students thereabouts receiving ELD instructional services at that level with about 4,870 at the middle school level 
and 5,968 uh, 5, at the high school levels, a little bit more. And you'll notice when you look at the data that was shared by Dr. Norton earlier, that we've had a huge influx of students specifically at ELP levels one and two. What we can tell you from looking at patterns and trends of our data over the past several years is that many of our students exit the ESOL program within two to three years. And so as you can imagine, this work is so important for us to make sure that they have the language that they need, that they're getting the literacy supports that need to happen so they can access their grade level content. So we always think about our goals focusing on how are we increasing our graduation rates? What does that look like over the past several years? We've moved from about 40 something percent to over 52% of our English learners at the high school levels graduating. Now that's not where we want it to be. We want it to grow even further than that, but we know how important it is to take out those incremental growths as we partner together on this work with our schools. So I just wanted to highlight that for you. We also focus on our English learners accessing both their English language development instruction so that they can develop the language they need to be successful, as well as their literacy instruction, as well as content learning. So all of these pieces come together to really make a difference for our English learners so they can be successful. And we also make sure that we focus on having high quality English language development services in place to support our students. This is collaborative work. This is difficult work, but we know and we believe that our English learners bring assets to the table. They bring cultural and linguistic assets. And so our job is to make sure that they get that additional language that they need as well as have the, the access to learn the content so they can be successful. So I wanna then highlight a couple things for you as we go through today, and I'll try to keep my comments as succinct as possible. So if we can go to the next slide, that would be great. So one thing I wanna emphasize, and I wanna just emphasize again that this has been work over multiple years to ensure that every single one of our English learners at the middle and high school level have access to language development that aligns to grade level content. So it's been a journey. You know that we adopted the study sync curriculum resources and we work with the vendor, we work with our English language counterparts, as well as with our teachers to ensure that not only do our students have access to that curricula, but they also have teacher created resources that are differentiated to help support learning. So we know that many of our students, again, program is a little different at the secondary level. We have courses. And so we're ensuring that in those ELD courses, our students have access to course the curriculum that they need. Um, we also ensure that all of our students at the highest proficiency level are in their grade level English classes. We're also making sure that our ELD teachers are working in collaboration with their ELA counterparts, that they're planning together in their professional learning communities so that they can ensure that their um, instruction is aligned to grade level standard. Over the course of the pandemic, we undertook a large endeavor where we knew that we needed to fully align our high school ELD curriculum resources to grade levels nine through 12. We collaborated first with our ELA counterparts to understand the curricula. We then analyzed it to see which one of our WIDA standards, those are the language development standards, aligned to our ELA standards so we could make sure that there was parity to ensure that our students had access to grade level novels. And we were very explicit in looking at how are we being culturally responsive. So we made sure that the novels that were selected, that the, both the authors and the protagonists reflected the faces of our English learners. So when you're reading um, Purple Hibiscus, for instance, do the students understand how the challenges that a student faces and what that might look like in their own lives and make those connections? So that was something that we did very deliberately. We also are ensuring that the assessments that are measuring language are aligned to grade level standard. So just wanted to, again, highlight and elevate for you that how important it is to ensure that our English language development instruction is aligned to grade level standard. We know that our students at the highest proficiency level at 
English language proficiency level four are in grade level classes. That means that a lot of work needs to be done to ensure that our English language development teachers get duly certified in English, and as well that our English teachers who work with our students have that skill to be able to scaffold and differentiate curriculum resources for our students. So that has been something we've undertaken this year, working with our ELA counterparts to provide a series of professional development sessions to support learning for both our ELA and our ELD teachers. In addition to that, we also know that we have some students that come to us at the middle and high school level that have interrupted formal education. So that means that our work is that we've got to build the literacy skills for our students. How do we ensure that they're learning language, that they're developing the literacy skills that are needed? You heard our special education colleagues speak to that work a little early when they talked about what needs to happen. For our students that are in the literacy program, we know they need foundational skills. They need the phonics potentially. They need the phonemic awareness. They need vocabulary. Those skills are really important for the students so that they can develop. And so we have adopted evidence-based curriculum resources to ensure that we're able to provide the uh, um, instruction that they need, the literacy instruction. And in addition to that, to ensure that we have data that is monitoring their progress along the way. To that end, we have 10 of our middle schools that have these programs. We have 12 of our high schools with these programs. Last year, we had about 400 students in the program. We've jumped to about over 600 students. So the program is growing. And so we're making sure that we work closely with our teachers, providing supports. In addition to that, providing the professional development and coaching needed to ensure that they have what they need to effectively meet the needs of students. Every year, we have progress monitoring sessions where we meet with school teams and we monitor student by student looking at progress in language, literacy, mathematics, and then we use that to inform what additional supports might be needed and what decisions need to be made. We also work closely with our parent outreach and our counseling team to make sure that they're part of those conversations so that if social emotional needs need to be addressed, they can help to support us in those efforts. If we can go to the next slide. Additionally, and you heard uh, Ms. Hewlett speak to how important this collaboration piece is. One of the core tenets uh, that we need to focus on is collaboration and to meet our goal of ensuring that all of our English learners have access to grade level content. We work closely with our content teams with math science, social studies. This has been an ongoing effort for the past several years. This year, however, we're going and working closely on three specific courses. We're working with our science team to make sure that there is addition, there's an additional course that's NGSS aligned for our students at ELP levels one and two. This is a new course that's being implemented in a few pilot schools and will be open to all of our high schools next year. And it is an earth space science course. So we're working with the team to ensure that all of those resources are differentiated. And in addition to that, professional development is provided for the content teachers that work with English learners in the science classroom. Um, in mathematics, we're focusing in on geometry. What is that, that differentiation? What does that need to look like to ensure that our students have what they need to effectively access the content, the academic language, and the content in that area? The same thing applies to US history. So again, as we work together with our colleagues in other content areas, we look and we say, based on what you know, based on data, what course do we need to focus on? What, which students might be accessing these courses? Which students will be impacted? And how do we make sure that we're meeting their needs? So those are the questions that we ask ourselves as we engage in this work. And it is so important that we make sure that we have those scaffolds and supports in place. It is an ongoing work and we know that it all can't be done in one year. It is over a course of several years, we'll be able to touch all of our middle and high school courses to ensure that the appropriate differentiation is built in in so that our students can fully access the content and that academic language that, that they need to be able to be successful in all of our courses. So if we can go to the next slide. 
So we also realize that it's, especially when we think about the pandemic and some of the learning loss and recovery that has happened, that we really need to be very explicit on the work that needs to happen to support our English learners. Um, I went back and I was looking at some of our data. We know, for instance, we have about 285 students that are in courses specifically from uh, math supports at the high school level. We have about 376 that are in our math 180 course to really help to build their needs. And these are our English learners. Um, when we're looking at reading, we're looking at about 1,048 um, students at the middle school level that are receiving additional supports for interventions from the Read 180 um, Reading Intervention Program. For basic reading, we have about 196 English learners that are receiving these supports. And in the developmental reading course where we're using System 44, we have about 396. I share these numbers with you so that you can understand that we at the school level and we at the central office level work very closely together to monitor our students and how they're performing. We look at language data, we're looking at literacy data, we're looking at math data. We ask ourselves questions about what needs to happen to improve programming for students. We want all of our students to have access to grade level content, but we also know how important it is for those that need additional supports to receive it. So I wanted you to be aware that these supports are in place across our middle schools and our high schools to support students as are needed. So we know that it is really that tier of looking at language development, literacy development, as well as math development. Just to highlight for you some of the things that you need to know about math, I wanted to just um, let you know when we talk about students who are receiving extra support in Math 180, and these are some of our students with interrupted education, as well as others, that it's a very robust program. Both System 44 and Math 180 are adaptive programs that really allow our students to receive instruction based on their individualized needs, as well as ensuring that they for instance, in the Math 180 program, have additional instruction related to division. Do they need to go deeper in that area and learn skills that they might have um, gaps in? Frac fraction concepts. What does that look like and how are we building that for students? Multiplicative reasoning and thinking. So those are the kinds of skills that are built into these adaptive courses so that our English learners are developing those math and the literacy skills that normally might have been mastered at a lower level, but we're ensuring that they have those needs met as they're in these programs. We also are looking at monitoring progress around language development. And we have quarterly assessments that are in place that help us check in to see how are our students doing as it relates to language development. For all of our students at the middle school level and high school level, they have these assessments and our school teams use these assessments as well as other formative assessment data to inform their planning and discussions in the professional development communities at the school level. If we can go to the next slide. So there are, there's a lot of professional development that we're doing for schools because we know that it takes about 42 hours to ensure that we're really going deep around whatever needs to happen for students. So to give you an example of one big effort we've been taking on this year is around collaboration and co-teaching. You heard Ms. Hewlett speak to the fact that collaboration and co-teaching can be very effective. Some of the work done from Honingsfeld and Dove, um, some of the work from Kenji Hakuda, as well as Idi Walke speak to how important it is to ensure that we are meeting the needs of our students as they're engaging in grade level content. At the secondary level, most of our co-teachers are in the ELA context. So that's where a lot of it is happening. However, there are schools where they're providing co-teachers in math, the math context and algebra one, for example, or in science and social studies for the, the NFL, which is the national state and local government course to really make sure that additional supports are in place for students. Over this summer, we were able to provide professional development for over 500 teachers who were in attendance. And we have an iterative process of professional development to really support them as they're applying the learning around collaboration and co-teaching in their classroom. And so we've had a series of four sessions to support them. 
We also know how important it is when we think about literacy development at the um, elementary level, we know that that's part of the teacher's work. When we get to the secondary level, it gets a little more tricky for students and for teachers. So what we're gonna be doing over the course of this spring and into next year is doing a lot more professional development work around literacy. What does it look like? How do we reinforce and how do we align to the science of reading? You heard us talk about structured reading and how important that is. And we know that for some of our older learners, they need those supports as well so that they can develop both the language and the literacy and can fully engage in their content classes and perform at high levels. So that's something that we're constantly working on. We have monthly content specialists and high school resource teacher meetings that take place where we focus around the leadership work that needs to happen, aligning to those big ideas, collaboration, equity, how are we integrating language and content, and what are those functional development needs around language that our students need, and how do our leaders support their teachers as they're working with them in the classroom, whether it's observation, coaching, in addition to monitoring that and analyzing that data to inform instruction. We also, over the course of the last several years, have provided ongoing professional development. During the pandemic, it was weekly professional development sessions. At this point, we are checking in and meeting with our um, teams, grade level um, ELD teams, where we're supporting them around programming effectively to ensure that they're meeting the needs of students, scheduling, professional development. And most recently, a lot of our work with professional learning communities has been focusing in on what are those ways that you're using assessments to both monitor language development and then also analyze that data to inform instruction. So we've had a series we've met recently with about eight schools, over 35 teachers, and we'll be continuing these sessions as we go into the fall. Around collaboration and co-teaching, we also know we provided macro professional learning and we're doing some micro professional learning, but we wanna go deeper and we plan to go out and observe and see what's happening in schools so that we can observe, inform future professional development sessions and also provide the coaching supports that are needed for our teachers. So very, very important. You heard us also talk about interventions and some of the numbers of students that are in interventions. There are coaching sessions that are available to teachers around some of the programs such as System 44. Um, there's another program called ILIT as well as Read 180 that are used to provide supports. And we do this work in collaboration, the ELD team, working with special education and English language arts to ensure that we're providing effective professional development to support our teachers, both our ELD, our special ed, and our ELA teachers. Additionally, we have done a lot of work over the years working with our math team around professional learning. This year, we'll be going deeper with them to say, how are we providing supports for our English learners in the mathematics classroom at the secondary level? So that's going to be very important for us. If we can go to the next slide. So we, there are a lot of various innovations that we've been looking at. I know one that the board has had a lot of interest in is what might programming and supports look like for our newcomers. So we want you to know that we are going about the due diligence of studying, going and learning about what other newcomer programs are doing, as well as talking to local um, districts about some of the program that they're undertaking. And we're looking to do some work in the newcomer committee that's coming up and then come up with some recommendations. So that is ongoing work that will be happening and we should be kind of coming up with some decisions moving forward. We also know how important it is to do this work with support ed. And you heard Ms. Hewlett mention that cohort from elementary to middle schools. And that is true, we, it has, there's professional development, there is coaching cycles, and it's really helping to improve and help content teachers understand how to effectively support English learners in the classroom around um, oral language development, around the scaffolds and differentiation that needs to happen. We're also working with Gaithersburg High School. They're the only high school that's currently in the cohort and really supporting them to look at what supports do our English learners need in their various content classrooms, as well as looking at some of the practices that can really make a difference for our English learners.
Additionally, over the course of this summer, and we plan to continue into this year, we've worked with Dr. Luis Cruz to really look at a systemic approach to how to analyze data and improve instructional programming at schools. So hopefully as we've gone through this session today, you've got a, a, a smattering of understanding of what we're doing related to programming, what we're doing related to um, the interventions that are in place for students, what professional learning supports are in place, and the ways that we need to continue to do this collaboration work to improve teaching and learning for our um, multilingual students. Okay, so I believe I'm turning it back over to Dr. Norton, and I think we will have some time for discussions. Thank you, Sanja. Uh, let's turn to some next steps, if you can go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we will examine students' progress on the interventions you've heard about today, and we um, plan to share data on that towards the end of March. Um, also in March, the secondary team will provide data meetings um, to METS teams. Um, to discuss students' progress and exits from METS courses. I also want to point out that access testing, which is the annual English language proficiency assessment that all English emergent multilingual learners must take um, annually, is currently underway and must be completed by March 4th. The results arrive at the end of the school year, and we are anticipating higher exit rates this year since COVID prevented most students from taking the test last year. Um, and a score of 4.5 or higher is required by MSDE in order to exit from English language development services. Next slide. For upcoming innovations, we are planning and proposing to provide summer learning to all elementary teachers on teaching language during content instruction. And as Sanja mentioned, we are working on proposal options for expanding supports to newcomers at secondary schools that offer METS courses. Um, and we know this is very need needed and Sanja has been doing um, deep research into this the past few weeks um, with her team. Um, we know that there's interest in the idea of a single school where students who are newcomers would go. Um, we met with a local district regarding their international school, which in fact is not designed specifically for newcomers, but um, for English learners in general for all four years. Um, we learned that it's an application school and um, with a small overall school population, one challenge has been to set up a school that has the same level of courses, clubs, activities, and resources as larger already existing schools. And um, you know, the district wasn't able to offer outcome data comparing that international school to other schools in the district. But we are delving into the research and practices at other districts in, as well in order to develop proposal options. Um, one key features of all of the proposals is that they have a school leader, such as an assistant principal, who would be focused on leading the program for, um, for newcomers as well as coaches or coordinators to make sure that um, students and service providers are in sync. We do have concerns about unnecessarily restricting students from peers, from language models, and from the general ed curriculum. And ideally, we could expand supports at students' home schools or somehow find a way to avoid creating additional transportation hurdles for our students. So we're continuing to talk with neighboring districts and develop these options. And so we hope to have something to share soon. Um, and to close, I want, just wanna to thank Tamara, Sandra, and the whole team for their incredible work and commitment to students. And this concludes our presentation and we look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Norton, Ms. Hewlett, and Ms. Blotner. And we'll open it up now to Ms. Sylvester, if she has some questions. Uh, Dr. Daka, how much time do we have? That will help me decide how many questions to ask, because I have a whole page. <laughs> oh, a whole page. Oh, my gosh. I think that we were supposed to go from 10 to 12. So we have gone seven minutes over already. 
Carla, you may have my time. I don't really have much. I, I know I have questions, but I'm sure that they're yours. So um, you yeah, can take ahead. my time. Yeah. No, I um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I think I will schedule a follow up. Uh, Dr. Norton and I haven't met face to face yet. So I think this will be an opportunity uh, to meet in person um to address my many 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 questions but i guess just for um today's discussion um you know really thank you for the work um i've been on the board for three years um and um i'm seeing a lot of improvements <laughs> to, to to praise it in the positive um and so um thank you for um thank you for your work uh Ms. Hewlett, Ms. Blotner, uh, Ms. Hazel, and thank you, uh, Dr. Norton, for uh, joining our team and, and helping us guide through uh, some much needed reforms. Um, I know that the changing of, of hearts and minds of our staff is was a tough and heavy lift, but was necessary. Um, and um, I guess just for today, uh, um, how could you help me understand the, the co-teaching? Because it, it sounds like that's a critical strategy uh, in all of this work. And, and particularly um, uh, co-teaching, I, I, just, I just don't know what it looks like in the classroom. Um, so if someone could help me understand what that looks like in elementary, and then um, it does happen in secondary, correct? So how does that happen in secondary? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, at the elementary level, co-teaching, you know, we like to say co-teaching and co-planning go hand in hand. So ideally, uh, co-teaching, uh, co-planning starts before co-teaching. So that means um, having schedule when teachers are, are, are um, meeting together for their planning sessions, the ELD teacher is very much a part of those discussions. And um, every teacher in that space has a role. Uh, what we want everyone to realize is that they all own our EMLs. It's not just the ELD teacher is responsible for the language development of our EMLs. The classroom teacher also has to um, do this work because our students are spending more time in the classroom setting than with the ELD teacher. Um, so when we're talking about co-planning, we are we are talking about the content first. The standards drive all of, of the work. Um, and so, so once the conversation is around what the standards are for the week or two weeks, however the planning structure is, um, there's a series of, of questions and considerations that the ELD teacher and the classroom teacher work through together. You know, what's the, the language um, that is very opaque uh, to our EMLs that to us, we, we, we English speakers take a lot of language for granted. Um, the ELD teacher has the expertise to say, you know, this academic language or this uh, potential text structure will prove some difficulty for our, um, our level one students. I think in this instance, we should parallel teach. So you take this group of students and I take that group of students. So decisions around models for co-teaching, decisions around scaffolds that are going to be used for our students in co-teaching, all of those are decided in the co-planning session, and then it's actualized when the teachers are teaching uh, in the same space. And every day might look different. Um, it depends on the needs of the students. Um, different models of co-teaching happen. Sometimes it's the ELD teacher takes the lead in teaching the entire class and the classroom teacher is a support. Uh, sometimes it's two teachers pulling two groups, focusing on the same uh, standard, but approaching it differently because it's a match for the needs of the students uh, in the groups. Um, sometimes it's one's teaching and one's pulling aside, which is different from parallel teaching. So it's really, you know, our teachers have to know the different models. They have to know the, the purpose for use of a model. They have to know what our students need, and then they act in response to that. So, uh, Schools are working it out where sometimes you have a co-teacher in a classroom for the ELA block. Sometimes the co-teacher is in the classroom for the math block. Uh, again, in response to what the data is showing that our EMLs need the most support in. 
And the focus is really on decreasing the barriers for English language development um, and, and elevating the academic language that students are going to need to use to demonstrate proficiency on the grade level standard. So to add to that from the secondary perspective, I would say we talked about proficiency levels you saw on that data slide, ELP 1, 2, 3, and 4. So for many of our English learners at the secondary level, the ones that are really in that co-taught model are at the top proficiency level. So ELP 4, all of them are in grade level classes, either with a duly certified teacher or they're in a co-taught model. Um, for ELP3, some students are in a co-taught model, and again, they make decisions based on length of time, what the needs are, looking at data, looking at past progress check data or um, formative assessment data to inform how they're making decisions. When you're thinking about co-teaching, we really need to think about it from the instructional cycle perspective. So you heard Ms. Hewlett speak to co-planning, and that's really, really important to make sure that those structures are in place. Co-teaching would be the next part of the cycle. And just a, a something to emphasize here, the model might look different. Um, it could be that there is one group and there are two different um, instructional components happening at the same time with the ELD teacher working with one group and the ELA teacher working, working with another group. If they could be reteaching, they could be um, foreshadowing and things that they're going to be learning. They could be parallel teaching, co-teaching together. Um, there are times when they might be co-planning and collaborating together and then they're doing separate groups. So that's another way that it might look. But I want one thing that we've done in the professional development that we've done this summer is really help our teachers understand how to prioritize what they need to focus on as a team, to understand how to work on the strengths of each other and building those relationships to really strengthen that partnership. That's going to be really important. Um, and really to make sure whatever decisions they're making is data driven. So that's important. One um, key component of a collaboration co-teaching model is having that content and language objective. What content is the student learning? What language aligns to that content? And how are we making sure that we have those two objectives in front of us, that there's instruction aligned to it, and we're assessing to see, did they meet that content objective or did they meet that language objective? So hopefully that kind of gives you a sense of what that might look like. And just know that we have students at the top proficiency levels, as well as ELP3 students, or so students at the that almost the middle proficiency level in all of our middle and high school. So you will see this pattern of either duly certified teachers or co-teaching happening for students in all of our schools across the board. Great. Thank you. Um, and then just for our follow-up meeting, these are some of the topics that I'd like to um, delve into. Um, I'd like to better understand uh, how the uh, ESOL audit is going to take place. Um, better understand how we're tracking the, the newcomers. Um, in a council presentation on newcomers, um, Diego Uriburu, I'm not sure I understood him. I wasn't sure if he was saying that we're placing too many kids in Mets or not enough kids in Mets, but uh, I just wanted to um, understand, better understand kind of our decision-making mm -hmm. process there because um, you know, some, uh, we just, we need to do a really careful job of our intake process to make sure that we're placing students where they're going to be successful and where, and where they really want to be. Um, <laughs> um, of the 17 newcomers that we lost, what happened to them, who's following up with them, um, uh, who provides the interventions that you are mentioning? given that we're doing a co-teaching model. Um, I wanna hear more about the professional development for content area teachers in secondary. We had spoken about doing a class in Spanish for newcomers, maybe in the sciences or the math. Um, I always hear that assessment, that ESOL kids are tested, 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 way too much. Uh, what are we doing about that? Better understand a dual, dual certification requirement for teachers in secondary. Mm -hmm. 
finally, um, how do you know the resources are being utilized by um, our educators in the classroom? What's your what's your monitoring or quality assurance? So to be continued. Thank you. Thank you so much. All great questions. I look forward to talking about them with you. Oh, you're gonna let me do it. Okay. That sounds like a whole meeting. <laughs> I would like to be included in that conversation as well. Good. Good. <laughs> I, I, I realize that. <laughs> but um, several years ago, maybe three years ago, we had some principals talk with us about the dual uh, well, co teaching. And I think the important thing about co teaching is to remember that they're equal teachers, the, uh, the language teacher as well as mm -hmm. the general teacher. And the same goes for special education because before they were not planning together. Um, the general education teacher was saying, well, you'll do this or you'll do that. It's really a combination of the skills of both parts. And I, I really um, think it's very important to have these supports because in the old days, we would have bridge programs, but they were not bridge programs when kids were at level four or level three or four, and we're going to go into regular classes, then they'd have a bridge program. But mm -hmm. the issue is making sure they're uh, exposed to curriculum uh, all the way through and not separated out and then suddenly thrown in for curriculum. And uh, that has not been successful. But anyhow, thank you so much, Dr. Norton and Ms. Hewlett, and uh, also uh, Ms. Blotner. And I see that Ms. Hazel joined us for a part of this, but thank you so much. It's a lot of information that you've given us and, and I do look forward to having uh, some of Ms. Silvestri's questions for it. Thank you. I think we're good. We're done. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Oh, the next meeting is the 29th. I'm sorry. The next meeting.